Oy vey. I loaded it up at the start of that song. I thought it was never going to end. <laughs> no, no crack. <laughs> Mazel tov. I'm your, I'm your speaker for the evening. Sorry about that. <laughs> I may not be what you expected. I'm a builder uh, from, uh, had a little business in a town called uh, Nazareth. Nobody expected anything good to come out of Nazareth. That's what they used to say. My name is Joe, Bar David, as you Goyim would say it, Davidson. <laughs> uh, bar in Hebrew uh, means like, like son of. So bar Barabbas means like son of the rabbi, the teacher. And uh, the, Barabbas, the Barabbas kids lived nearby to us. Uh, very religious family, very um, patriotic. But anyway, my name is uh, Joe uh, Davidson. Joe Ba Davidson. I'm uh, David's son, son of David, King David, that is. Uh, whoop de doo not a big deal. There were actually a lot of us Davidsons in, in my day, and even though I was a Davidson, I didn't feel like no son of David. I felt forsaken. We all did. It had been a thousand years since David was king, so there was Assyrians, Assyrians, Babylonians, Greeks, and then for the last 60 years, the worst of the whole bunch, the, the Romans. I mean, uh, I felt like God's name should have been something like God is not with us, or maybe God is not salvation. What I'm saying is God the Father was missing. And no, I know that it's, it's kind of different in your day. But in my day, if you didn't know who your, your daddy was, you didn't know who, who you was. It was a real problem. We had a nasty name for it. And if you were one of them, you probably kind of acted like one of them because, you know, you felt like you had to prove yourself, like you had to justify yourself, maybe even kind of create yourself. What I'm saying is I felt like a bastard. We all did. Like a good Jew, I'd pray to God every day, but in my heart, I was screaming. Why have you forsaken me? More than once, Roman soldiers burst into my shop. Screaming, Jew, make a cross for a Jew. I mean, it's really simple, it's just like, it's just two, two timbers like this, uh, kind of notched out, and then you, you kind of put them together, uh, kind of like, like so. They, they could have done it, they could have done it, but they told me to do it just to humiliate me. So I, just to get through it, I, I remember I, I would, just to get through it, I would, I would picture, you know, one of them nailed to the wood. Because I wondered, I mean, even as I would do this, I would wonder, um, what if it was someone I knew that got nailed to the wood? And so I would picture, you know, one of them, one of them, like a Roman centurion, I'd picture him laying down on the wood, and the Messiah, the son of David, the king of the Jews, pounding the nails. He would show them what crosses was for. According to the Torah, cursed is the man that hangs on a tree. The Messiah, he would take them damn Romans and he would nail them to their damn tree. 
that's, that's what I figured. That's what I expected. I brought this one just to, just to show you. Those were dark times. And Israel was a dark place in a uh, very, very dark world. <laughs> but uh, I had a light. <laughs> Her name was Mary. There's just something about Mary. <laughs> we were already betrothed. Um, that was like married in my culture, but no sex. And believe me on that one, Mary was a saint. I loved Mary, but her in-laws were like a bag of mixed nuts. They were like, you know, just a mishugana, just insane. One day Mary came to see me at work. She, she seemed troubled like she was pondering something in her heart, and then she told me that she was going to Judea to see her crazy old Aunt Elizabeth, and then she mumbled something about her crazy old um, uh, Baron Aunt Elizabeth being pregnant. And I just laughed. I laughed out loud. And then Mary left, and I felt forsaken. Three months later, when Mary returned to Nazareth, you know, I was just so glad to see her, but I could tell that something was different. I'm a carpenter. I'm not a gynecologist. I said to Mary, Mary, why the, why the trip? And um, uh, why the unexpected weight gain? <laughs> and she kind of looked down and mumbled, I'm pregnant. And then she broke down weeping, and I, I mumbled, who? And then she mumbled, God. I said, no way. She said, Yahweh. I said, no way. She said, Yahweh, no way, Yahweh, no way. Yah, way. Now, that name, Yahweh, that was so holy that we wouldn't, even, we wouldn't even say it. And now I'm expected to believe that a 14-year-old farm girl from Hicktown, Galilee, is impregnated by Yafe, the consuming fire? Ah, that's insane. That's Meshugana. Maybe Mary's Meshugana. I was so hurt and angry. You know, the law prescribes stoning for adultery. But I couldn't hurt Mary. She was so sincere. She said, Joe, the angel thing, he said nothing shall be impossible for God. But in my mind, the words Messiah and bastard just did not go together. Impossible. I decided to divorce her quietly, but my heart wasn't quiet. It was screaming. My God, my God, why, why have you forsaken me? Why have you forsaken your bastard boy, Joseph? But then, I got an angel too, in a dream. Shows up to me, this is what the angel said. It said, Joe Davidson, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Wow, wow, save his people from their sins. You know, even as the angel said it, I'm thinking to myself, don't you mean uh, Romans? I mean, that's the more pressing issue. You know, 500 years before, King Ahaz, King of Israel, he needed saving from the Syrians. And Isaiah the prophet prophesied to King Ahaz saying this, uh, A virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel, that means God with us, and of his government there will be no end. Now at the time, Ahaz, King Ahaz must have been thinking, well, thanks for the baby, but I was hoping kind of for an army, you know? 
<laughs> and in our time, we figured, okay, so then there's a baby, and the baby grows up to be a real kick-ass messiah. So I put it all together in my mind, forget the sin part, and think, that's my boy, the kick-ass messiah. So anyway, I wake up from my dream. I run, I run across town. I find Mary where she's staying. I drop down. I beg for her forgiveness and, you know, to come back to me. And, and in spite of all the gossiping and the kibitz and in Nazareth, I took her home to live with me. Now, the angel thing said that we should name him Jesus. Yeshua is how you'd say it uh, in, 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 our, in our language. Uh, Jesus is how you say it in, in English, but Yeshua comes from Yahashua, meaning God is salvation, and it was kind of a common name. Some of your ancient manuscripts still even record that one of the Barabbas kids was actually named Jesus. So, Check this out, there was a Jesus Barabbas, Jesus son of the rabbi, son of the teacher, and there was a Jesus son of David, or maybe son of Yahweh, Ba Yahweh, woohoo, and also Ba Joseph. Anyway, we didn't know quite what to make of all of it, you know what I'm saying? But me and Mary, one thing we did know is that God was in this. And if God was in this, then we knew that it would be smooth sailing from here on out. <laughs> right? That's what you think. Health and wealth and, and no more crosses. Particularly for Jews. For Romans, sure, but not for Jews. That's what we expected. It was about then that the Romans declared a, a census. Now, they didn't mail a form to you. If only we had it so good. No, you had to go to them in the town of your origin, which for me was Bethlehem, city of David. Bethlehem means house of bread, Bethlehem. I always wondered what bread, what bread are they talking about? I didn't know. But anyway, it was like a four-day journey to, to Bethlehem, and Mary was heavy with child. O little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie. Not so much. Was the census, Meshugana, insane. And Mary's labor pains had begun. I'm a carpenter, not a gynecologist. We went to an inn. We found an inn, and the innkeeper said it was full. I said, Look at her, she's pregnant. And the innkeeper says, it's not my fault. And I yell back at him, it's not my fault either. <laughs> Best we could do is we found, a, we found a stable. Mary was in anguish. I was in anguish. Did I screw up Christmas? I mean, what a putz. I had thought God was with us, but all I could see was pain and flies. All I could smell was schmutz and poop and fluid. Lady fluid. <laughs> and I'm a carpenter, not a gynecologist. Mary screamed. There was no time to think. The baby was coming. Let me rephrase that. The Messiah was coming. Jesus was coming. I was about to meet God. And what a place to meet him. What a way to meet him. Oy vey. Keep in mind that I was not only being introduced to Yahweh, I was being introduced to the nether regions of the female anatomy. <laughs> In our religion, all that blood and lazy schmutz, that's, that's unclean. And this place was the place that God appeared to me? You know, church people, they'll often say, so, when and where did you meet Jesus? That was when and where. <laughs> kind of kind of shocking, kind of funny, I know, but also kind of found profound. I mean, the very place that we all cover in shame, that's where he appeared. What did he look like, you ask? A booger. 
covered in schmutz? I mean, seriously, you ever seen a newborn baby? Didn't look like this. <laughs> didn't, didn't look like that. Sure didn't look like that. I mean, that's just creepy. <laughs> Radiant beams from your holy face. I mean, who writes this stuff, right? It wasn't like that. It was a thousand years of failure and pain and shame and, and darkness. And then an eight-pound naked baby boy covered in schmutz crying. God, with us, not what I expected. <laughs> hey, you know, every baby is breath of God in a little bag of blood and dust and schmutz. Every baby. That means everybody in this room. <laughs> anyway, Mary screamed and she pushed and suddenly I was holding him. He cried and cried and cried and then I said, Yeshua. And like that, he stopped. Shabbat. He knew my voice. Imagine all those months, I would speak and my voice would like reverberate in everything in his womb world and now he knew me. And so I knew him. I cut his cord with this rusty old knife that we had. Mary, she did her best, you know, to clean him up and then she wrapped him in rags, held him to her breast and he suckled. And I remember I said to Mary, Mary, oh my God, my God, Mary, do you really think that that's him? And she said to me, quiet, Joe. The baby needs to sleep. And so I wondered, of course I wondered as I wondered, what if this was God somehow? Had God ever been held like this? Was this what God had always wanted? To be loved? When he's good for nothing, because he's always good for something, right? But when he's good for nothing, just a breath and a bag of dust and schmutz. Good for nothing, just good. Such thoughts that I thunk that, that night. Maybe the creator is so much more than unquenchable fire. <laughs> Maybe the unquenchable fire is unquenchable love. I had always feared God. But I remember thinking to myself, hey, you know, I kind of like God. It was that night, it was that night that I dropped to my knees in front of my baby boy held to my bride's breast. What I'm saying is that I, I bent the knee and my tongue confessed. I love you. Baby was asleep. I whispered, Mary. Mary, could Yeshua be him? Could this be the incarnate essence of Yahweh? Seeking some sort of intimate communion through this canonic, this self-emptying manifestation of his essential ontology, his essential beingness. And I remember Mary, her eyes looked on mine and, and she whispered, shut up, Joe, the baby's trying to sleep. <laughs> we placed him in a, a manger made of wood, our own, as how you'd say it in Hebrew, like, like this, like a box. Uh, this would be like a, a box, it, or you could translate it, ark. And suddenly it hit me. This is the ark of the covenant? A manger covered in schmutz? Not what I expected. People pass by and snickered at the pitiful sight. I would have too. Maybe you would too. Because nobody, nobody expects the king of glory in a place like this. Nobody. 
Well, except for shepherds, redneck shepherds. But that was only because like an entire legion of fiery angels told them all about it. But why them? Why did the angel tell them? I guess because God likes to party with shepherds and carpenters more than kings and Pharisees. And that makes some sense if you, if you think about it. We, uh, we had a party. <laughs> they held Yeshua, sang to Yeshua, danced with Yeshua around the campfire. We had a party, and then, and then they were gone. And I remember thinking to myself, maybe I'm the Meshuggah. Maybe I'm insane. You know how it is? Because it seems like God gives you just enough to go on, but you're still poor, and you're still confused. And you're still sitting in the dark in a stable covered in schmutz. <laughs> well, you know the, the stories, right? The Simeon, Simeon prophesied in the temple uh, uh, this child would be, you know, like a, a sign uh, for the rise and the fall of many. You heard how the pagan wizards, they came and they gave, they gave presents to Yeshua. You, you, you heard how I had another dream and we fled to Egypt. You heard how Herod heard, learned from the wizards about this and he sent his soldiers, his soldiers to massacre all the little baby boys in Bethlehem trying to get to my Yeshua. Yeah, you heard how we moved back to Nazareth and you read how Jesus, Yeshua grew in wisdom and stature. <laughs> and I got to tell you, I just, I fell in love with my boy, Yeshua. But you know, at first it kind of stressed me out being his dad. I went to the uh, great dad seminar, you know, at the synagogue. <laughs> Nothing. They didn't have anything on raising the Messiah. <laughs> you should have seen me try to tell him the facts of life. <laughs> that was a trip. When he was 12, we accidentally left him at the Passover feast in Jerusalem. I mean, we were a day away, and I said to somebody, where is Yeshua? They said, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, and suddenly I realized I lost the Messiah. That's big. I ran back to Jerusalem. I found him in the temple. He looks at me and said, did you not know that I would be in my father's house? Sounds kind of smart alecky now, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, but, but he didn't disrespect me. With, with, his, with his words, as if I wasn't his dad. In fact, it was as if he expected God the Father to show up in me. So you see, his words didn't take anything away from me. They actually gave everything to me. I taught him stuff. Or I should say God the Father taught him stuff to me, Joe. This one day, we're working on a bench, you know, in, in my shop. And I get like a, a splinter in my eye and Yeshua, he tries, to, he tries to help me get it out and he gouges my eye in the process. I remember I yelled, Jesus Christ! And I look at him with my one good eye and he's got like a whole bag of sawdust in his eye and I said, Yeshua, don't go around trying to take specks out of other guys' eyes when you got a stinking log in your own eye. I told him that. <laughs> I taught him how to make yoke for oxen. He became famous for his oxen yokes. They were so uh, easy on the oxen. That means they fit the oxen so well that any burden was like light. <laughs> when Yeshua would get blisters, or he cut himself by accident, it was me that said to him, hey Yeshua, don't worry about it. <laughs> to make anything good, you gotta put a little flesh and blood into it. That's what it means to be a builder, a creator of beauty. You see, God the Father, Father the Messiah through me. Not what I expected. The rumors persisted. That was actually very much what I expected. The other kids would tease him, especially the Barabbas kids. They called him Jesus Barahu, Jesus on the who, and they called him bastard. And they use that word very intentionally because if anybody ever calls you that or called you that, you need to know that you are in very good company. They called him bastard. 
but no one ever acted less like a bastard than Jesus. No one ever acted less forsaken than, than Jesus. The kids would tease, and yeah, Jesus wept, but he was weeping for them because they didn't know who their Abba was. They didn't know who their daddy was. They had daddy issues. <laughs> I think we all do. But in Jesus, there was no fear, no shame, no need to hide himself or justify himself. It was like everything in his world. And I mean the light, the dark, the pleasant, the painful, the good, what we would consider the evil, everything in his world vibrated to the sound of his father's voice. And this is what God the Father was constantly saying. Look, this is my beloved son, Yeshua, in whom I am well pleased. <laughs> but check this out. It didn't make Yeshua proud. Just the opposite. Constantly grateful. Many, many times I found him just like dancing by himself, dancing and laughing. And I would say, Yes, what are you doing? And he'd look at me and he'd say, God likes me, Daddy. He really likes me. And he really, really likes you. My Abba is your Abba, Abba. Call Abba, Abba, Abba. And then he'd just start giggling and dancing. He was a walking party. No matter who you was or what you'd done, just your mere existence was like reason to throw a raging party. <laughs> that made me nervous. Because that's how you get yourself hurt. See, love makes you vulnerable to pain, and Yeshua felt pain, I, I think maybe more than any of us. It, it wasn't as if he didn't feel no pain, it was how he bore it. Love bears all things. Yeshua's yoke was easy, but not because there was no burden. It was how he, he bore it. It was like every moment was a cup handed him to him, handed to him by his father, and so he drank it with abandon, constantly giving his life away, losing his life and finding it. In other words, Yeshua had faith. He had what all of us are missing. We should believe that we have been forsaken. I mean, it's like we have no faith in, in love, but not Jesus. He is who we all are meant to be. And so people either surrendered to him and his walking party, or they wanted to kill him as the ultimate insult to their ego. And yet Yeshua never judged his soul. You see, it was his very presence, like a light shining in the darkness. It's the judgment of this world. Just like old Simeon said, he is set for the rise and the fall of many, a sign that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Jesus bar David, is the judgment of God. Jesus Barabbas is our judgment. <laughs> Save yourself with yourself. Pilate, on Good Friday, gave us a choice. Would you have Jesus Barabbas or Jesus Bar David? What kind of Jesus do you want? What kind of Savior do you want? One that would crucify his enemies? Or one that would be crucified by his enemies and for his enemies? One that would save you from the Romans? Or one that would save you from yourself? Of course, we all voted for Jesus Barabbas, that's our judgment. And so our father handed Yeshua a cup and he drank it to the last drop. It was a yoke, a crossbeam fit for him from the foundation of the world, 
For Yahweh said, I will make a helper fit for you, Adam. I was no longer present in your age, in your space and time, and yet I did see, I do see, everybody sees. Like the prophet said, every eye will see him, everyone who pierced him. They nailed Yeshua to a cross. My cross. I don't know if it was one that I made, but I knew that it belonged to me. And so I brought it to, to show you. I'm just going to set it up here. Hey, thanks, buddy. You're like Buddy the Elf, aren't you? Yeah. They nailed him to a cross, and uh, it belonged to me. I knew it belonged to me. First the sky grew dark and the earth began to shake. Yeshua lifted his eyes to the Father, and he cried, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That was my line. <laughs> you know, that's also the first line from Psalm 22 written by King David. It starts with that line. Do you know how it ends? With the conquest of hell. Read it. It's in your Bible. He lifted his eyes and he cried, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me, that was faith, spoken from a place of absolute faithlessness, my place of faithlessness, my, my fear and my anger and my shame. That was Yeshua praying to God, our Father, on my behalf, confessing out loud what I had only grumbled in the dark and in my own heart all those years. That was Yeshua, the Word of God, Having descended into all our fear and anger and shame and forsakenness, the hell in which we all trap ourselves. That was God. That was God calling to God from the dungeon of our own godlessness. When you find beautiful things in unexpected places, like light suddenly shining in the darkness. Or maybe a little logos in the midst of all the chaos. Or maybe a little bit of faith, hope, and love in hell. Oh, then you love those things more than you ever would have before, right? Why else would you wrap all your presents for Christmas morning? Why do you do that? You're hoping that someone would, you know, Open your present and go, wow, I never expected that. Wow, wow, wow. And they would love it all that much more. Maybe all creation is like wrapping paper containing the burning heart of God our Father from the bosom of the Father, our God. I never expected God in Mary. I never expected God in no manger. I never expected God on a cross, and I sure as hell never expected God in hell, my own personal hell. You see, maybe all the sin and suffering and sorrow and shame is wrapping paper. Maybe this like entire world is like a dark theater prepared for the revelation of grace, which is the glory of God. It's in the darkness that we fall in love with the light. And Yeshua is the light. Yeshua cried, Father, forgive them. And then it is finished. And he delivered up his spirit. And it was at that moment that the Roman centurion 
dropped to his knees before Yeshua, and he confessed out loud, surely this was the Son of God, and I knew exactly what he meant. He meant what I had meant 30 years before. I love you. Yeshua was hanging there naked as the day that he was born. Covered in nothing but bruises, blood, and schmutz. And check this out. Mary was there with him. And not just Mary, because now there were several Marys. There's, there's Mary of Magdalene, and Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and Mary the wife of Clopas, and the other Mary. And by that, I think they mean the men, you know, John, and my namesake, Joseph of Arimathea. They were all, they were there, and they took him down from the tree. They, they knelt before Yeshua's body broken and his blood shed. They kissed his wounds, and I knew exactly what they meant. They meant what I meant 30 years before. They meant what the centurion uh, meant. They meant, I love you. I love you. I love you. They placed him in Joseph's tomb. <laughs> Just as he had found his way into my heart 30 years before. Joseph's heart. And, of course, he rose from the dead because he's the life, the life. And tonight, you will bend the knee, kiss his wounds, place him in the tomb that is your heart, and sing to him like the shepherds, and I know what you mean. I love you. Just at least a little bit. He who loves is born of God and knows God. God is love. And that means that all of us here tonight are highly favored. We're Mary. You know, Jesus, you check this out, okay? Read your Bible. Jesus really didn't use the name Davidson very often, a son of David. He hardly ever, if ever, referred to himself as the son of God. But he had, did have a name, a title that he seemed to use, that he liked maybe more than all the others. Do you remember what it was? Yeah. Son of man. Go figure. God is his class, father. Yeah, and he only has one father. That means that man, humanity, Adam, you, is his yeah, so tonight, you may be feeling quite a bit of, of sorrow. You may be feeling some real shame and confusion and darkness and pain. And yet in the midst of that empty pain, you may also sense a little faith. It means trust. You know, just like maybe the size of a seed or maybe a little bit of hope. Or maybe a bit of love. Well, this is the good news. You're pregnant. And it's not your fault. You see, that means it's not your responsibility. That means it's a miracle. It's the gift of God in you. I'm saying that which is conceived in you is of the Holy Spirit. You're like a virgin that conceives and gives birth. To what? Faith, hope, and love. And an entire new creation, including you. The true you. The new you. So Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, for on the night that Yeshua was betrayed, he took the bread. Undoubtedly from Bethlehem, just a few miles south of Jerusalem, he took the bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body given to you. Take and eat. And in the same manner, after supper, and having given thanks, he took the cup. And he said, this is the blood of the covenant 
This is the covenant in my blood, poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, all of you, and do it in remembrance of me. Now, I know that this is shocking. Unless you've been around a long time, then maybe you're not shocked, but you should be shocked. This is shocking because, you see, we all take his life. There's only one life. It's not your life. It's his life. We all take his life. That's where we come from. We all take his life. That's called sin. And yet, even before we can take his life, he forgave his life. That's called grace. And that is the glory of God. So you understand, if, if you reject this, you're choosing nowhere and nothingness. Because he's the builder. And this is how he builds all things with his own flesh and blood. If you reject this, you're choosing nowhere and nothingness. But when you surrender to him, and I believe you will surrender to him, is Christmas. Christmas to you and Christmas in you and Christmas through you because through you he's filling all things. And one day like me I think you will say I never expected God and no unwed teenage pregnant farm girl. I never expected God in a manger covered in schmutz. I never expected God hanging on a tree in the middle of a garden on a mountain called Calvary. I never expected God in hell, my own hell. I never expected the God to fill all things with himself. But most of all, I never have expected God in me. And let me put it another way. I never ever expected to find the Son of God in me. I don't mean now to make your head pop. But I think that Jesus called himself son of man so that his old dad Joe would finally call himself son of God and hear our father as he spoke and all creation reverberated to the sound of his voice. This is my beloved son, Joe, in whom I'm just so pleased. You see, I am so not a bastard. And neither are you. So anyway, where do you least expect to find him? Because you got a place, I know you do. Maybe it's a memory somewhere in your past. Maybe it's some shame that you never speak of, maybe I don't know, it's a fear, anxiety, a resentment in the present, a place of anger, perhaps. Would you just close your eyes and think of that place, all right? And from that place, I want you to say what Mary said. You can say this just in your heart. Just say, Lord, may it be done unto me according to your word. And then come to the table, tear off a piece of the bread, dip it in the cup of the juice or whatever, and then put it in that spot. And I think that you will find, either now or later, but you will find that he's been there all along, waiting for you. And this is what he has to say to you. Merry Christmas, my beloved son, my beloved daughter, 
in whom I'm just uh, so pleased. Merry Christmas. Hey, I didn't know, I don't know if you knew this, but I was actually Joe Davidson. That was me. What? Yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah, it was. That was, that was me. Uh, anyway, right now, uh, maybe you have one of these candles. If you want to grab your candle, um, we're going to light these in just a minute. Let me read this uh, verse to you. This is one of my favorites. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. He was the builder. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And the Word, they remember, is the light, became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, beheld his glory, as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. No one's ever seen God. The only God who is in the bosom of the Father, from the heart of the Father, he has made him known. And so we'll uh, light this candle from the Christmas candle. And then uh, we'll pass the light throughout the room, okay? And when you light your candle, remember if you can keep the unlit candle vertical. No, that's wrong. Whoa. You, you tilt the unlit candle on its side and light it from the lit candle, okay? And then we'll pass the light back as we sing Silent Night. And, and by the way, the, the rays from his face are metaphorical, okay? I don't know, but maybe it's shown. I don't know. But anyway, uh, let's... Uh, celebrate the birth of our Lord together right now. And so, Lord God, we thank you for who you are. Yahashua. It's in his name that we say, thank you, Merry Christmas, and amen. amen. And so, uh, by way of benediction, Merry Christmas to you, and uh, thank you for uh, joining us. I was a little weird tonight, I know. I try not to be so weird most of the time, but uh, we'd love to have you join us uh, every Sunday. So, Merry Christmas, and uh, believe the gospel. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <laughs>